Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will fill our hearts with gratitude, that you will fill our hearts with conviction, that today in this place we will be able to rightly discern what side of the dividing line we are on, that we will come to a conclusion about our lives about where we stand with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to speak to you on the subject this morning. God's wake-up calls. We are in a year of awakening. And so I want to talk to you about God's wake-up calls. Years ago, you can't imagine how busy I was in ministry. Let me just give you a glimpse. Deons and I were on the road constantly. Teddy Grover was with us in those days. We traveled from city to city to city to city. We were never, ever off for a week. We were preaching constantly. Even before I got married, that was also the case. Preaching as many times as I had the opportunity. I remember in Pocatello, Idaho, I preached 27 times in five days. It was just amazing how busy we were. And I will never forget Waking up in a Holiday Inn, because when I opened my eyes, it was obviously a Holiday Inn. In those days, they all looked the same. (laughs) Bed was in the same place. Restroom was in the same place. Television was in the same place. And I looked around to the room, and honestly, I did not know where I was. True. True. I didn't know what city I was in. I'd been so busy. And I I picked up the phone and I, I, because I'd gotten a wake-up call the night before. Phone rang. So I picked up the phone and the woman said, you know, 7 o'clock. I said, thank you, ma'am. But ma'am, 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 please, I know this sounds strange. But you will tell, will you tell me where I am? She said, after a pause, because I'm sure, honestly, she probably got a lot of questions like that in a hotel over the years. But people didn't know where they were for different reasons. (laughs) Wasn't because of their travel schedule. She said, oh, you are in... Memphis, Tennessee. And I thought, oh, yes, of course. I start the crusade at First Assembly here in Memphis this morning. See, this is what you need to understand about God. There are going to be times in your Christian life, in your walk as a believer, when he is going to faithfully send you a wake-up call. And you are going to discover in that wake-up call not only what time it is, but you're going to discover where you really are. And this morning, I want to talk to you about God's wake-up calls. The first wake-up call I want to talk to you about from Scripture is the wake-up call of crises. Throughout the Bible, we read of instance after instance when God sent his apathetic, rebellious, idolatrous, sleepwalking people the wake-up call of crises. Now, the principle is obvious. You can arrogantly reject God until crises awakens you to the fact That he is the only hope you have left. For Israel, 
crisis has been a wake-up call that God has used as a last resort, but he has faithfully used it throughout the ages. You see, God's people in Scripture were famous for their unfaithfulness to Yahweh, even though he had given them every advantage and kept every promise to bless them. They still rebelled. Genesis records that the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah were so great that the outcry concerning them reached heaven. We know, of course, the Lord completely destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And it is still the example of sinfulness out of control, of rebellion unhinged. But by the days of Isaiah... Isaiah could write that the people of Judah were as reckless in their sins as the inhabitants of Sodom. Isaiah 3, 8, and 9. Listen to this. These are his words. Jerusalem staggers. Judah is falling. Their words and deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. We're not talking about pagan people here. We're talking about God's people. The look on their faces testifies against them. They parade their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. You see, when God's people forget where they are and who they are, there is going to be a wake-up call of crises on the way. If your blessings have lulled you to sleep, get ready for a wake-up call. If your success has consumed you and you have defiantly and willfully chosen your will over God's will, get ready for a wake-up call. If you have slept through every dealing of God, get ready. For a wake-up call of crises. If you have ignored every gentle, loving attempt of the Lord to wake you from your slumber, get ready. Your wake-up call of crises is on its way. You know, I've never seen it fail. Just like the story of the prodigal son. The Bible tells the story of a son that actually represents all of God's sons and daughters. And you can't miss this. Because this story is not about sinners. It's about believers. This story is not about a kid who never found God. It's a story about a kid that wandered away from the grace and the provision and the glory of God and decided to rebel in his heart against everything that he knew. That's who this story is about. This story, ladies and gentlemen, is about us. Let me read it because not everybody knows this story. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Are we having problems getting it on the board back here? I don't know. Between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, Listen, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Now, I want you to notice something here. You, as a member of the father's household, have a choice. You can stay in tune and in touch with God and experience the bounty of the protection and the provision of the father's household, listen, while the rest of the world, in fact, the Bible says the rest of the country was in famine. We're worried about what's going to happen to the country. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you this. If you get out of the father's household, if you decide to put other things before him, whatever comes on the country is going to come on you. The only shelter and the only security for the people of God is to stay 
in the favor of the Father. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. There's the crisis. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He's in crisis. Now it's a crisis of identity. He's no longer a prince. He has a job that was not even acceptable to the religious community that he came from. He is in a place that is unclean. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I'll sit out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. All I'm saying here is if you're writing in your Bible, I want you to put beside verse 21, fully awake. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You see, this is what you need to understand. God loves you so much. He will allow you to become thoroughly disillusioned with the things you choose over his house, the things you choose over his presence, the things you choose over his values, the things you choose over his authority, the things you choose over his will for your life. He will allow you to crash and burn in a helpless heap of your own efforts and to look around with a fresh focus and discover or rediscover everything I really need is in the house of my father. Because listen to me, when God has to resort to crises to wake you up and to let you know what time it is and where you are, he has resorted to that so that you might return to his blessing, his favor, his protection, and your inheritance. We don't preach this anymore, but it's the truth. Walk through the Old Testament and see how many times God dealt with his people in crises. You may say, that doesn't scare me. It won't work. And the truth is, you may be right. Because for some, even crises will not wake them to the call to come home to Father God. Here's the second wake-up call, the wake-up call of conscience, of conscience. Do you know that you have a built-in alarm in your psyche? You know that every man is born equipped with a conscience. That's why it's so rare when you find someone who is a psychopath, who just has no conscience, no ability to feel empathy. No sense of right and wrong. The fact is, conscience will always do its job if you will listen. Everybody has the voice. Everybody. Conscience is a powerful picture in God's Word. Have you ever really thought about how many times it appears in Scripture? Just the word conscience. Romans 2.15, listen to this. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, 
while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Perfect picture of conscience. 2 Corinthians 1.12 For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience. Have you ever had your conscience testify to you? Has your conscience ever said, don't go in there? Don't return that call. You know that's a little shady. Don't tell that lie. That's a lie. It's your conscience. It's your inner voice. Interestingly enough, you have it before you ever receive the Holy Spirit. Everybody has a conscience. It's your wake-up call. Acts 24 and 16. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward God and man. Romans 9 and 1, listen to this. These are kind of standalone passages. That's what amazed me. As I begin to look at context, I realize that really no context was necessary because the truth is more like a proverb from the New Testament. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Titus 1.15, listen to this. To the pure, all things are pure. To the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciousness are defiled. You see, your conscience should be the only wake-up call you need. But so many things in our lives can be allowed to override our conscience. I'm afraid that we are yet another generation sleeping through the wake-up call of conscience. Romans 1 describes those who sleep through the wake-up call of conscience. Listen to these passages. Because that which may be known of God is manifest to them. Now, I want to get this straight. God says that everything that can be known of God is manifest to everybody. There is an inner voice that accurately and consistently points you toward God. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, and God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Who are they? Those that rebel against God. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This is the plight of those who continually override the inner voice. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you something. We have done our best to create a message that makes us so socially and culturally palatable that everybody feels comfortable in our midst. May I declare to you that a church that preaches a gospel where everyone feels comfortable is preaching no gospel at all. I don't want us to make people feel comfortable in the pew so that they can go through some kind of metamorphosis so that they can just finally just blend into the Christian behavior that's around them. 
I have discovered this in my own life, and I have watched it for over 50 years in ministry, and even when as a child in this church, that when the altars are filled, they are filled not with good people wanting to become better, but with sinners that are wanting to become saved. And the only way that happens is when we begin to stress the inner voice. Does your inner voice this morning tell you you're a sinner or a saint? Does your inner voice tell you that your private life is an abomination to God? Does the inner voice tell you that what you've been doing on Facebook, talking to people you have no business talking to, is a violation of your code of conduct as a blood-bought believer? Does the inner voice say to you that it's time for you to stop drinking so much? That it's time for you to stop criticizing so much? That it's time for you to stop worrying so much? That it's time for you to stop claiming your stuff as your stuff and to get generous again? Does the inner voice put his finger on what's really going on in your life? Does he call you to task as a loving father would call you to task? Because ladies and gentlemen, if that isn't happening in your life, then you are listening to the wrong voice. It's a wrong voice that exempts you but cannot transform you. We've always been a church of conviction. People get delivered from their sins. They're not told that you can continue to live any way you want, my friend. It's like somebody seeing a cancer patient and telling them, you've got cancer here, but I want you to go home, eat well, and exercise. And we just hope things will work out. Eventually, it'll just go. Folks, I don't want a doctor like that. I want a doctor that pulls out the scalpel and says, you know something, we can get rid of this thing. But there's going to be some pain involved in a recovery period. And I'm going to say, you go ahead. I can take that because I want to be free. And ladies and gentlemen, I pray that Shreveport Community Church will always be that place that when people walk in, that suddenly the inner voice is activated again. Suddenly it is clear and it is distinct again. Suddenly they understand that this is the voice of heaven and God is calling me to the understanding that I don't have to live in my sin. I don't have to live in my bondage. I don't have to live with the sickness of my spirit. I can be free. I can be holy. I can be righteous. I can have a plan for my life. Praise God. Wake up call of conscience. Nothing can be more specific and articulate that inner vo than that inner voice. What are you hearing? Right now. What's your conscience saying to you? You can trust it. I believe that if you will just trust it, you'll leave this place in new victory. Because every wake-up call is not an end within itself, but it is an invitation to know where you are so that you might find yourself where you need to be. Now, here's the third wake-up call. The wake-up call of God's goodness. You say, that's a wake-up call. Oh, is it ever? Listen to these passages on the goodness of God. 1 Corinthians 16, 34. Listen to this. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. And I love this next verse. For his mercy endures forever. Everybody's excited about the abundance of mercy that's been poured out on you. I want you to give him praise right now and thank him from the depth of your heart. Hallelujah. He's good. He said he's good. Ezra 3 and 11. I don't ever remember reading much from Ezra. They sang responsibly. Praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever toward Israel. Psalm 25 and 8, listen to this. Good and upright 
is the Lord. I, I get tickled sometimes at these, um, these archaic phrases that we find in the King James Bible, but if you translate them to modern vernacular, they would sound very different. This is what this one would sound like, honestly. Good is the Lord. He's a stand-up guy. There you go. How, have you, how many of you found out he's a stand-up guy? He's always got your back, doesn't he? Hallelujah. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 145 and 9, the Lord is good to all. How many of you understand he's good to everybody? Mm. And his tender mercies are over all his works. Mark 10 and 1, no one is good but one. That is God. James 1, 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Matthew 7 and 11, if you then be an evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I love Psalm 27, 13, because this is the truth. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Psalm 145, 5 through 7. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts. I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. That's Psalm 145, 5 through 7. And yet Romans 2 and 4 ask this question. Listen, do you despise the riches of his goodness? And forbearance and long-suffering? Let's use some synonyms here to allow us to understand this better. Do you ignore the riches of his goodness? Do you ignore the evidence of his goodness? Do you ignore his patience with you? Do you ignore the history you have with God? Don't you know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Don't you understand that if you just look at how good God is and how good he's been, that it should bring you to your knees? That it should cause you to rush to this altar and fall in a heap and say, God, why in the world would I ever compromise or grow cold in my life or put other things before you? Do you understand that if you could just see his goodness, if you could just embrace his goodness, if you could just get a revelation of his goodness, it would be the loudest wake-up call that you've ever had in your life. And that's all that would be needed. God, you're just so good. And Lord God, you're so good. I repent of everything. I don't want to do anything that displeases you. I don't want to do anything that gets on the margins. I don't want to compromise. Jesus, you're just so good that I don't want to serve anybody but you. I don't want to be like anybody else. I want to be like you. You've just been so good. Hallelujah. You know, I, I can tell you that your pastor, Denny Rodney, lives this life right here. I've never been around anybody in my life that is as grateful for the goodness of God as D. Rod. I'm just telling you, he's my son. But I don't know that there is a day that I don't hear him tell his mother and me how grateful he is for us. That he doesn't express gratitude for his beautiful, wonderful wife, for his great children that that he doesn't thank God for everything God's ever given him. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. I, I'm around him and over and over 
and over again throughout the day. All I hear is him pouring out gratitude to God. Lord God, I don't deserve it, but Lord, you've done this in my life. Let me say something to you. It should be the only wake-up call we need. Our lives should be at a standard and a quality of obedience and faithfulness that amazes the world. And when the world asks, how in the world do you live the life you live? We look at them incredulously and say, are you kidding? Have you seen how good God's been to me? Come on, give the Lord praise. He's been good to you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Here's the last wake-up call. Simply the wake-up call of God's voice. Turn to the person beside you and say, this is the ideal wake-up call. One of the sweetest, most tender stories in the Bible is found in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3. And it's the story of the calling of a young boy to be God's confidant. Although Samuel was a prophet and Samuel was a seer, his major role was to be the one man on earth that God could talk to. He was God's confidant on the earth. He would tell Samuel everything he was going to do before he ever did it. Verse 3 says, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. If you don't know the background story, there was a woman by the name of Hannah who was grieving over the fact that she didn't have a son. And she had prayed and fasted and wept in the temple of God. Oh God, please give me a son or I'm going to die. And the angel of the Lord appeared to her, and this is what the deal became, the agreement between God and Hannah, that when the boy was weaned, that she would bring him to the temple, and he would be raised there in the temple. And when he was old enough, he would simply serve the priest of God, Eli, all the days of his life, he was given as a bond servant to God as the gift of gratitude for God answering her prayer. Pretty amazing. And so that's where we pick up. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. Now what Eli did, because Eli probably had inside information, I don't know, is that he didn't just take Samuel and use him to clean things up. He actually allowed him to come into the holy place and to begin to minister to the Lord under his tutoring. So he literally became a discipleship of the priest. Now, there's a long story with this. One part of it is really key. Eli longed for that role in Samuel, probably because his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were men who were compromising, backslidden men, priests that broke the heart of God. They were immoral. They were greedy. So in Samuel, I believe Eli saw what he had hoped his sons would be. And so they were very close. In fact, at night, they slept in pretty close proximity to each other there in that holy place in rooms that were kind of adjacent. And the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, this is the old man, was lying down in his usual place, the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Evidently, one of his jobs was that he would stay by the lamp of God, that menorah, until it burned out because 
you were never to quench it. And so he had to wait until it burned out. So this little boy, get a picture of him. He's in the house of God. Just a few feet from him is the Holy of Holies. He's curled up on the floor beneath the menorah, waiting for it to burn out. There's another sermon there. And that is if you want to hear from God, get close to the place where he dwells. I won't go there. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you call me. But Eli said, I didn't call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lied at, laid down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you call me. My son Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you call me. And Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. Lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening so Samuel went and lay down in his place the Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times Samuel Samuel and when Samuel said speak for your servant is listening the Lord said to Samuel see I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle Samuel's asleep and the voice of the Lord awakens him let me say this to you you know what God's will is today that this message that is the voice of the Lord to you awaken you today it's that you don't ever have to go through a crisis to awaken you that your world doesn't have to crash and burn that you don't have to face financial loss. You say, but that's an old kind of message. No, my friend. If you want to know God, you can't just read the New Testament. You have to read the Old Testament. Because in the New Testament, God's plan is revealed. But only in the Old Testament are you really going to know His character. And I can tell you this. That when God starts to see His prodigals leaving, He's going to make sure that they have a crash and burn moment. But there is no need that that ever happen. It was always God's will that you simply be able to hear His voice. That you know it's the voice of the Lord. And you wake up. And you do the things that he's called you to do. That is his will. Can you right now from your spirit. Just ask God to always make you sensitive to his voice. To always make sure. That it's only the voice of God that you need. To wake you up. The most desirable wake up call for every believer is the wake-up call of God's voice. Oh, my friend. Is he speaking to you today? Is he trying to wake you up? You know, for years we, uh, we did something here that was actually very effective because I've, I've met dozens, if not hundreds of people whose lives were completely changed by a moment in the invitation when we would turn to each other and we would ask, are you absolutely sure your life is right with God? Now that statement is designed to do several things, right? Number one, in the life of those that don't know Jesus, it's designed to give them an opportunity to really know the Lord and, and to come forward and receive Christ without having to come by themselves so that somebody comes with them. Believers bringing believers bringing unbelievers to the Lord but there's something else it's designed to do and that's to keep us as the people of God in tune to the fact that just as Israel strayed and just as the Galatians lost their hold of grace 
And just as Ananias and Sapphira disobeyed the Lord in the New Testament, and just as the warnings of Revelation address churches who each had lost their former glory, that this little question just asked sweetly and with great compassion and humility, but yet very directly, are you absolutely sure your life is right with God? was able to reawaken the voice of God in us, to reveal the voice of conscience. Amen? And this morning, I can tell you, real revivals always have as one of their main elements the repentance of the people of God. They don't happen without Christians repenting, without Christians stopping their rationale of the way they're living, of the way they're speaking, of the way they're thinking, of the way they're acting, of all that is in their life that does not measure up to the goodness of God. And so I am contending for revival here, aren't you? You know, I can tell you that you know, Downs and I have talked about it so often, but, you know, we're just kind of having to chase D-Rod and Sarah in this because they are determined. They're studying revival. They, they can tell you more about revival than anybody just about I know. They believe that in this next season, we're going to see an awakening that will surprise all of us. It will shock even those of us that have the greatest hopes, aspirations, and visions. That God is going to do something extraordinary. But without the element of the wake-up call, it will be a shallow, emotional, passing thing. But oh, when you add the habitation of the Holy Spirit to the power of obedience, Everything changes, and even communities can be shaken for God. Don't you think it's time, my friend, that that happened for us? I want you to stand, please, all over this place. Hallelujah. Praise God. Bless the name of the Lord. I'm going to ask you quietly and reverently to turn to the person beside you when I give you the signal. And I want you to ask them this question. Are you absolutely sure your life is right with God? Now, don't do it right now, but just in a moment when I give you the signal. If that person says, no, I'm not sure. Then I want the one who asked the question and the one who answered the question to both step into the aisle and I want you to come and stand right here because we are not leaving his house until we get right with him. You say, will he just take me out of my word? Oh, absolutely, he will. In fact, that's really all you've got to give him because you certainly can't give him a promise. You'll break those every time. You just give him your word that you want to be right with him and you don't feel like you are. And at that point, he will begin to empower you. And he will work with you. But does that mean I'll never fail again? Oh, no, my friend. No. What that means is, is that failure will never be acceptable to you again. That's the difference. It will never become a lifestyle. It will never be that which defines you. And it will never be anything that you protect. You'll disdain it. You'll hate it. Because when compared to the goodness of God, oh, it's got to go. Just a moment. We're going to turn. We're going to ask this question of the person beside us. Are you absolutely sure your life is right with God? If that person says no, I'm not sure. Then I want the two of you to come, and I want you to stand right here. Those of you that have never really known Jesus, and those of you that have known him a long, long time, but you've begun to sleep a little lately. 
You say, I need to be woken up. Thank you for this wake-up call, Pastor. I, 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 I want to hear God's voice. I'm hearing the voice of my conscience, and I'm hearing the voice of God. And I know God's been so good to me. I'm ready, ready, ready to just give him everything. Boy, recently I've seen people in this church make decisions that have just been transformative. I've watched the joy in their lives. Not people that are unbelievers, but people that are Christians. I've watched it happen. I've watched it happen. You see, some people are confused by grace. They would say that this isn't a grace message. Oh, yes, it is. Because you can't save yourself. It's only by grace that you're saved. But the verse after that verse says that you were created for good works. You were transformed so that you might agree with God and walk with Him. Don't you ever think that He forsook His values or His character or His desire for you. He does not forsake His nature. That's not grace. That's an aberration. That is heresy. But what God's calling you to is this. After that grace step, He says, okay, let's walk together. Let's get this right. Let me just tell you something. I got a little quarterback out there that's going to be an All-American. He's going to be great, but he hadn't had it together yet. He threw way too many picks last year because I didn't get him trained. It wasn't his fault. I didn't get him trained yet. But you know something? I've, I'm not kicking that guy off the team. Are you kidding me? I'm going to stay right with him, and he's going to be able to see it better than I see it. And he will be able to cooperate with the plans and the purposes of the coach. Now, I know that on Super Bowl Sunday, they may even be a corny little example, but get over it. That's the truth. God's not going to kick you off the team. But he wants to coach you into victory. And you can't do that until you're fully awake. you got to get awake. Amen.